Hi everyone. Um, hi to those of you who joined us last week. Welcome back. And to those of you who are joining for the first time, welcome to. Um, I'm Abby Hart. I'm in the manufacturing team at Knowledge Transfer Network, who are lead on helping innovators with physical products get their ideas um, from a concept, from a sketch on a bit of paper, from a prototype through to scaled up manufacturing. At KTN, we work with innovators across all different sectors to, to challenge their ideas and their thinking about the market, the offer, the opportunity, and we help develop robust propositions. As well as that, we build collaborative networks to help um, them to deliver results. We're looking to do more to help innovators move from their idea to get through to manufactured product. And this is something that we've found is very challenging for people to do. It's a challenge that often people underestimate. Only a very small proportion of physical products ever make it through to scale production. So determination is, isn't enough to make this work. Timing and opportunity are, are critical, but experience and skills tip the odds in favour of, of being successful. So with developing physical products that require manufacturing, there's extra challenges to contend with, things that, that are over and above the normal challenges with, with innovation. You've got extra dependency on third party relationships with contract manufacturers, designers, suppliers, distributors. There's a diverse range of skills and knowledge required and significant investment is needed up front. Things like tooling, materials and labour have got to be invested in before you can bring a product to, to, to market to sell it. So in partnership with Product Design Scotland, we've set out to achieve two things through this series. Firstly, to address the diverse skills and experience required. We provide insights through experienced and expert speakers, and there'll be opportunity to ask them questions. Secondly, to help address the need for strong relationships and connections, we want to help build a diverse UK-wide community who have interest in navigating or helping other people to navigate the design to manufacture journey. So this, this series is about building a set of resources to help people grow their idea and make it um, a tangible reality. So each week, over, over 12 weeks, we'll be focusing on a different challenge, something that from experience we see recurring. So this, this week we're looking at um, developing robust propositions. So this, this is definitely a, a real hurdle that we, we experienced innovators facing. If you've got a proposition, that's compelling, there's hope that you'll be successful. But if your proposition doesn't stack up, no amount of clever engineering is, is going to get you there. So getting this right is really fundamental. Um, to shed some light on this topic, we've got an awesome speaker line up today who I'm sure are going to really help expand your thinking and help you see this from a number of different perspectives. Uh, just very quickly before we get started, I'd like to just mention Meeting Mojo. So this is the networking part of what we're doing here, trying to encourage you to connect is really important. So if you check, check the box for wanting to connect people on the registration form, you should have been sent a link to the Meeting Mojo platform. If not, don't worry, um, let me know and we can sort, sort that out. So obviously you can't see the other delegates that are on the call at the moment, but there's lots of you out there with a wealth of experience and an equal amount of you with ideas who would benefit from that experience. So we'd really like to connect you up. To be able to see who else is here, to get in touch with them, then yeah, the Meeting Mojo platform is there for you to be able to do that. So just to reiterate, if you didn't get a link and you'd like to be part of that, let me know. So yeah, today we've got three great speakers lined up and then we'll move on to the panel session. Um, so if you can post your questions in the Q&A section rather than the chat, it will make it easier for um, Ali, who's going to chair that session, to, to find the questions and to prioritise them and, and get them to the speakers. And then right at the end, um, after the Q&A, we'll have a roundup um, of, of what's been discussed, mentioned what's coming up in following weeks. So please hang around for that. But for now, I'm going to hand you over to my co-chair, Ali McEnroy, the CEO from Technology Scotland, and he'll introduce the speakers and run the Q&A panel session. Ali. Hi there, thanks Abby, and hi to everybody. Um, thanks for coming along. It's, I've noticed we've now ticked well over the 200 mark in terms of participants, which is absolutely 
Uh, excellent. So, so thank you all for, for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ali McEnroy. I'm the Chief Exec at Technology Scotland. We're the Industry Association for the Enabling Technology Sector in Scotland and the home of Product Design uh, Scotland. I'm going to be your chair for this section of the meeting and will facilitate the Q&A after we've heard from our three speakers. Today, that might be easier said than done, given we've got such a, a large audience, but please don't let that put you off submitting your questions, which you can do at any time from now. As Abby says, using the Q&A box, don't use the chat box, it'll just get lost uh, in the mist. Um, also, it makes it much, much easier for me if you could identify in some way within your question which one of the panellists you are directing that question uh, at. Given the expected number of questions today, uh, it will be kind of one panellist per, per question in terms of answers. So that makes things much, much easier. Right, so we have plenty of time. We'll get straight on to our guest speakers. And uh, first up today um, is Mark Shaler, uh, the founder at Eight. Uh, and in the sense of building a business case today, Mark is really, I guess, starting right at the beginning of this process in terms of identifying some of those uh, market drivers. So Mark, I'm going to ask you if you can share your screen and then it'll be over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Mark and I want to talk to you today. Well, I want to talk to you about uh, lots of things, but the main thing is I want to talk to you about the power of insight over data. Data is really important, but, but insight just, just has the edge. Um, in many ways but before that just a bit of a hello from me and um, I use the same slide all the time to say hello just a little bit of Lionel and my children now now think it's hilarious because I'm 51 and they are they're French from 26 down to, to 16 and they say dad your cultural references are getting old and and they are absolutely right they are getting really old now and that's a real watch out as you begin to, to innovate, as you get older, you need to stay in touch with what's happening. And it's, and it's really easy to dismiss the youth because it's not really what you know. I mean, memes, I don't even, uh, they, they laugh at memes. I don't get it. I laugh at jokes, but they laugh at memes. And it's important to actually stay connected. So having that intergenerational connection really, really matters. Uh, what I do, <coughs> it's not a big sales pitch. That's what I do. It's on the screen. Um, <coughs> and I've been doing it for about 30 30 years now, and I, I, I help companies become more creative in one way or another, and I tend to focus on sustainability. But when I say creative, what, what do I mean? What is creativity? Um, and there are many ways that we can define creativity, but to me, the best definition is to imagine a world that isn't here yet. I love that whole idea of thinking, of thinking what if. And our education system, and actually the way that we're employed at work, sometimes works against this. And it takes away the freedom to, um, to think completely crazily. So I tend to use really lovely, simple processes where I get them people to come up with three brilliant ideas and then three dreadful ideas. And there's always gold in the dreadful ideas. If you've given someone permission to come up with a rubbish idea, then there will be something really good in there. I can guarantee it. But to my mind, creativity all starts with a problem. All opportunities are born out of a little pain point. And, and, and I think a designer or a creative's key skill is, is not design or creativity, it's observation. It's seeing that problem or watching for a, work, a workaround where you can begin to innovate on that. And, and again, I don't think a designer's job or a creative's job is to move a pencil or to move pixels. It's to move hearts and minds. We, we buy things increasingly because of emotional attachments and we stay with one brand over another because, because of emotional attachments. And the, and the product's got to do its job, absolutely. But there are many, many good products out there and only one of them can be the cheapest. So all the others have to have something else built into them. There has to be something built into the proposition that, that grabs you at the heart. Um, so how, how do you have better ideas? And just go with me on this because it's tangential to woo-woo. Um, first of all, you ask a better question. Ask, ask what problem are you really really trying to solve and, and and I think that's so underrated just to sit in the problem for a little longer and then to talk to people not like you if, if your innovation team all look sound and think like you then you they're not broad enough diversity is strength in every single possible way and 
you, we've just got to step outside of the, of, the, of the clubs that we already have and in, embrace other people in our innovation processes, in our design processes, and in our creativity processes. And there's no excuse anymore. I can find 300 people in the next half an hour to give me insights on, I don't know, how my pen works. And I can do that using my magic tools. They're, they're all on here. Experimentation is, is at the touch of a, of, a, of a touch screen. So you've got to talk to people who aren't like you. And then go with me on this last one, meditate. And I don't mean OM, although it could, it could be OM. I mean, shift your brain waves from beta, which is our waking brain wave, into alpha, which is our relaxed brain wave, and into theta. And theta is the brain waves that we have just before we fall asleep. It's the brain waves that emerge when we've done something that was really monotonous like meditation, really monotonous, or maybe riding your bike, or maybe gardening, or maybe just being in the shower. The whole idea of theta brainwave is that it comes when your brain doesn't have to do anything else. You're not using your frontal cortex to make decisions, so it can go crazy wild on ideas. And Thomas Edison, um, who maybe or maybe not, depending on what you read, invented the light bulb, he used to use meditation, he used to seek meditative state on purpose. And he would he had a tricky problem to solve. Like, how do, I, how do I make light bulbs last less long, for example? He would sit on a chair. You can't see me, I don't suspect, but he'd sit on a chair and he'd have a table next to him with a bit of paper and he'd write the question on the paper really big and he'd put between his legs, he'd put a metal cup between his feet and then between his knees, he'd pop a coin. And he'd hold the coin between his knees and he'd meditate. And as he began to move from beta into alpha into theta, he'd fall asleep. And his knees would open because he'd fallen asleep. The penny would drop, and that's where the phrase comes from, into the metal cup. It would wake him up, and he'd write down whatever he was thinking about. So moving into theta brainwaves is a really lovely way of coming up with better ideas. And, and, and actually probably coming up with better questions as well. It's where we're, we, are, we are at our most creative. And... Leading on from that, it would be really easy. We, we have so much data, we're kind of drowning in it. And it would be really easy to go and into data for creativity. And, and you can do that. But data is the history. Data's already happened. It's really important. The, the, but, but the more important thing is to innovate around what will happen. So it's about stretching data into insights. Now, that takes a different kind of mind. That takes a different kind of thought process. So I can help people get into that thought process with a really simple paper template that I use called POINT. Um, it stands for Pains, Opportunities, Insights, Needs, and Themes. And I'll talk you through really quickly because I don't have long, but it's dead straightforward. You don't need anything apart from the letters P-O-I-N-T, Pains. Just think about the problems and the pains that you see around you in your field. So your field might be, um, I don't know, plumbing. Um, it could be book binding, whatever it is. It, it kind of doesn't matter to me. You might be designing pens. What are the pains that we see around us? What are the problems that we see people coming up to again and again? And, and then are we seeing any work around? And then this is like a Joycean stream of consciousness technique. Just get them down. Just jot everything down really fast. What are those pains? What are they? And then for each one, either draw a picture of it. Drawing's great. Or, or just describe it in, in less than 30 words. So after maybe two minutes, you don't want to spend much more than that on this, you'll have a pile of, of problems, pains, whatever it is. And then you move into opportunities. So what opportunities automatically flow from your thinking about that problem? And this, these could be really, really broad ones. So here's a problem. So my dog was put down last year, 16, little Jack Russell, scrappy little thing, really bad breath. I mean horrific the last two years of my dog's life were his, his name was ralph were um heralded by someone shouting whenever he walked into the room out and that's a really horrible thing to be sent out of the room as soon as you've arrived pretty unpleasant i was the only one that would give him any fuss so the problem is he smells no one wants him near him it's not the problem the problem is the last two years of his life were really miserable because he felt unloved that's not the problem the problem is the when you, pet, when you pet a pet, your, um, your stress levels drop massively and everybody lost that part. So the real problem was the interaction with the pet. 
So the opportunity there is actually, what could we do to solve this problem? Well, we could use dentist sticks, they, they, they exist. We could be really brave and, um, and brush his teeth with toothpaste and, um, and a brush. No one wanted that job, I did try it, it's not a pleasant job to have. Um, and then I came up with the idea of mint flavored dog food. And I thought, genius, he'll eat the dog food, it smells of mint, everything will be fine. It's a rubbish idea. But that's the kind of scope that we're looking for in terms of our opportunities. How do we build a solution into something that we're, that we're already doing now? And then when you've, when you've got your problems or your pains and you've got your opportunities, have a look at insights. This is, where, this is where the magic is. And I've already talked about the insight here. So the problem isn't the dog's breath. The problem is the dog and my quality of life. So, so the insight is all around having to, wanting to pet, an animal all the way through its life to make it feel comfortable, but also to, to, to reduce stress. So, so the insight is the relationship between an animal and a human rather than actually the smelliness of, of, of that relationship. But there'll be more than one insight, just, just, just get them down. I did some work a long time ago with a charity who, um, they did a load of um, sporting events, triathlons, they were first in tri to triathlons, first into cycling, all, all of that kind of stuff. And then when you went on their website to buy kit to support them, they had like the worst trainers and the worst running kit in. It was just, they were elite sports supporters and they sold kind of like Aldi level kit. And, and so the insight here was how do we develop better products? So how do we pa partner with someone like Azeeks or how do we partner with someone like Brooks to produce amazing kit? And that's a really nice insight. And then the other trend that we'd seen was this growth in kind of mass participation sports, things like parkrun. So that's another little bit of data, a little bit of useful in information. And then the other insight we had was the growth of, of, of collective sport within women and, and, and the kind of the safety that that provided. And we thought, this is, this is really interesting. So the opportunity there, the insight grew from the data, but the insight was about togetherness. The insight wasn't about sport, but the problem was our kit crap. So you can actually follow this all the way through to get to an insight which will surprise you for certain. And then what are the unmet needs that we see in this field at the moment? What, 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 what's out there? And this is numbers, right? So, so how, many, how many people own dogs? How many families have this problem with the relationship with a, with a dog? How many women want to do sport and don't? How many people have got the wrong shoes on? Well, whatever it is, what is, the, what is the need that's missing? And you can begin to put numbers in to this point. And then the last one, the T, this is themes. What are we seeing here? What themes are we seeing here? And this could be around collective activity in that, in that example. How can we pull themes out that we can grow not just this product around, but we can maybe grow another product around? Are we seeing something here that is a more strategic trajectory rather than more of a product development opportunity? And then this is the goal, isn't it? This is where, where, where we need to move in terms of um, ensuring a sustainable product development um, platform. So I, I use point all the time. It's a really simple process. And then once I've got my list of insights, my list of opportunities, I use that to ideate around. I'm not gonna go into ideation. Somebody else is gonna, gonna talk about that in a minute. And there's loads of techniques out there and whichever one you're using will be fine. You know, it really will. But you begin to build ideas around something a raindrop formed around a, a little grain, a hygroscopic nuclei. Without the grain, without the little bit of dirt in the air, the raindrop won't form. And so you need something to form around. So I use those pains and those insights to do that. And the challenge, as ever, is to not be a five-year-old playing football, not to all race to the same corner of the pitch, not to be all rushing <coughs> to online solutions, all rushing to vegan food or whatever the current trend is. Challenge is to play where the ball is going to be. The challenge is to understand what's going to happen next as much as what's, what's happening now. And that, that, that's about, that is about observation. That's about sitting in the problem for longer and having a really broad view of things, always having your radar on and, and forming opinions at the very last minute, being as open and as fluid and as vulnerable as you can. So my, my, my challenge here or my challenge to you is you have all the tools to experiment. I build startups inside really big businesses and I, and I work around a problem or, or I work around an insight. 
And the things that we need in order to experiment, first of all, are um, permission. We need permission. You can ask for forgiveness, but it goes a lot further if you've got a bit of permission. Protected space. So the design team or the engineering team are given protected time to develop something and speed and, 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 and agility. And that, 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 that really happens. That really matters. But, but you have all the tools here. If you come up with a new product or a new service, you can test it this afternoon on any social platform and know by tomorrow morning how many people would be interested. We, we can do this now. So the, the aim would be before you even make your product, make your market. And I'll give you one very quick example of this. And this isn't, this isn't, this isn't, they don't manufacture this product, they subcontract. So I, I appreciate that's not, not for everybody here, but as an experiment, it's brilliant. So the company is called Painter and they make jackets. They make really nice jackets and they make them three times a year and they make 300 of them and they cost 200 pounds each. They're, they're, they're like a shirt really, a shacket, I think you'd probably call them. And they sell them in advance. So you want one, nine o'clock on a set Saturday morning, you go online and they sell out, they sell out 300 jackets at 200 pounds in four minutes. There's a waiting list for everyone. They then take those 300 orders and only then do they buy their fabric. And they know what color and they know what size is, so they don't have any waste in that fabric process either. So they have a whole process that is waste free, time efficient, and most importantly, on day one, they get all their money in, 200, sorry, uh, 200 pounds times 300 jackets, that comes in and they don't need to pay anything until week eight because they're made on week six and they pay on two weeks. And then the jackets arrive and, and, and they, they know they're gonna sell, they've sold every single one already. So how can you do this? I'm not saying still that idea, although it is a brilliant idea. What I'm saying is how can we test our market? How can we know that our product's gonna sell out before we even launch it? And I have a friend who uses Kickstarter a lot for this, crowdfunder, that kind of thing. And he says he won't launch anything unless they know they're going to hit target. And there are loads of really smart ways that you can do this. And understanding the problem that the consumer's facing and understanding the consumer insights is the top tool in your armory. So just to finish off, data matters, really does. But insight matters way, way much more. You're going to, have, you're going to go through two more great presentations today. You're going to learn absolutely loads. If there's anything you want to ask me, I'm going to hang around till the end. Thank you so much for your time. If you need to get hold of me, well, I'm quite easy to find. I'm all there. All right. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. That was jam-packed, full of great stuff there. But uh, I'm going to be nipping out to buy my first ever shacket just after this, I think. As I mean, maybe a few in the audience are doing something similar. So um, we're going to move on now to our uh, second speaker, who's uh, Jake Larson. He's a noise transfer manager and design team at the Noise Transfer Network. And he's going to be talking about bringing together the components of uh, successful innovation. So Jake, over to you. Ah, we're already still here. Perfect. Yeah, thanks so much, Alistair. Uh, great presentation as, as well. Thank you, Mark. I've just uh, subscribed and downloaded a few episodes of your podcast that I'll enjoy later, I, I, I think. Um, so I'm going to take, um, I think, 10 minutes, if I can squeeze it in, to talk about the KTN Innovation Canvas. Um, I'll get into a little bit about what it is and how it can help you. A little bit about me first, though, is that um, I used to be a, a designer, a product designer. Uh, I like to think I still am a, a designer. All good designers practice design thinking in, in everything that they do, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I would echo all of Mark's, Mark's points there. They're all absolutely valid. And we've tried to embed uh, quite a lot of that design thinking in the innovation canvas. So what is it about? Uh, what's the tagline that I've put here? It says, help you to prioritize challenges to take your innovation to the next level. So what we find at KTN is, especially for early stage innovators, uh, you can feel somewhat paralyzed by uh, all the things that you need to do. So we've developed the innovation canvas to try and help you prioritize those next steps when you get a bit of insight, maybe. Um, okay, sorry, there we go. So uh, the innovation canvas, what is it? Well, uh, there's a print version that you can see in the background there. Um, that's for collaborative teams to work in real life to really thrash out uh, what, what you need, need to be focusing on. And there's an online version um, that's kind of for self-service for recording those, um, those, those sessions that you have with your teams. Uh, and that's me. So yeah, uh, if you've got any further questions beyond this, 
Um, I think we're going to be sharing slides and things. And please do contact me if you've got any other other, other questions too. Um, okay, so quickly, this is uh, a brief insight into the conversations that we have at the Knowledge Transfer Network with the innovators that we work with. Uh, the ideal innovation journey in the minds of many innovators looks something like this which is you kind of have an idea, it's definitely the best idea, I just need funding, if I could build it, spec it up uh, and roll it out, then, we, then we'll be millionaires. Um, um, and unfortunately, it doesn't always go like that. I mean, this is a bit tongue, tongue in cheek, but jokes are 80% real, they're true. Um, they're not uncommon in the innovation journey, it looks a little less linear, it looks a little something like this, where we too often have conversations that sound like, oh no, we're gonna to have to start again. We've sunken loads into this idea. There's no turning back now. And in the worst cases, what, what you end up with is not really what you envisaged in the first place. In the very worst cases, it's not what your customers want either. Um, and we want to try and avoid that with, um, with you know, good um, uh, product development practice and good de design thinking. So the one message that I'd like you to take away from this presentation, if the innovation canvas is not relevant to you, the one message that I'd like you to take away is that there's no one recipe or equation or format for innovation, because if there was, everyone would be doing it. And the person that then breaks that format would then be innovating. So I'm gonna show you another tool, another canvas. There's so many different tools and canvases out there, and I'm not saying ours is better than anyone else's. In fact, I want you to ignore the, the format of it and the framework of it. I want you to ignore the phraseology of the words that we use in it. What's more important is that you are, that your mindset is prepared for uncertain and unexpected things uh, rather than just blindly following another canvas. That's my caveat before I introduce it. Um, so what is it? So uh, the Innovation Canvas was made collectively with all 200 people in uh, KTN. So there's quite literally thousands of years worth of innovation expertise embedded within the Innovation Canvas. Uh, that's my, uh, to try and make, make it credible. And the way that we define uh, innovation is we define it as a continuous conversation between three core drivers. So an innovation could start in any one of these drivers, but importantly, it's a balanced conversation between all of them. It could start with an opportunity that you see on the bottom there, which is maybe an unmet need within a marketplace. Maybe there's some users with a frustration um, or competitions just really naff. Uh, or there's a change in regulation and you can foresee that diesel engines will be phased out and electric vehicles will be a thing of the, the like future. Um, an innovation could start in the offer. So the reason why we've used the phrase offer instead of product is, you know, services are, are also relevant too. So product or service, is something that you offer that is of value to those people in that marketplace. And maybe you're looking for people to like sell to. You've been, you've made 5,000 prototypes in your shed and you're looking to sell it to someone or you're looking for a means of production which brings me to capability up top which is maybe you've got a certain niche set of skills or you've got a bunch of coders that can uh, that can code ai chatbots let's say or you've got some underutilized um equipment or underutilized space um an innovation could start at any one of these places but uh, a true innovation is a balanced conversation between all, all, all three of those. Um, alongside the innovation canvas, we've got some questions cards. And if I'm perfectly honest, these are the most valuable aspect of the innovation canvas. These questions have been taken from funding um, competitions that exist or um, in, investor um, uh, questionnaires to, to meet with investors. Um, and we use these questions cards as provocations to help you think differently about your innovation. So uh, this is the innovation canvas. This is what it looks like. We have those three core drivers um, set out as we see here. There's no real hi hierarchy to them. Uh, no one is more important than the other. We've broken them down into their constituent uh, topics. And we've broken them down further still into their further subtopics. Now, we've tried to avoid jargon and um, wherever possible and uh, try and make this as 
relevant to as many different sectors and industries as possible. Um, and that's why we've provided the, the like questions cards because risk may, may mean one thing to one sector and something else to another. So we use those questions cards to really try and dig deeper into uh, your needs. Going through the innovation canvas, we, uh, we pop scores in these little squares here. The scores are based on how confident we are in, in your claim. So when you say, I've got zero com com competition, we then dig deeper to then say, where's the evidence? Prove that to me. What's the confidence in your claim? So working through it, you may score user needs five, pop down a little note up in the top, top corner there. When I do this with academics, they, they work left to right, top to bottom, um, and more creative types, I suppose, um, are a bit more discursive in how they talk about their projects, and they may bounce over to approach here, and they may talk about what, what their offer is to meet that need. But after a 45 minute to a two hour session with companies, we usually see a, a very thorough innovation canvas uh, like this with all the details of your innovative project that you're working on in front of you um, It's a really nice way on an a3 piece of paper to have all of the aspects about your project that you're working on in front of you In the middle is possibly the most important thing which is your top challenges. So Obviously the low scores are going to be your top 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 challenges uh, but also some things that you may have overlooked and taken for granted would also be your top challenges. So where you've said competition, we've got that sorted, that's a five. And when we dig a little bit deeper, you then go, oh yeah, I suppose I could do a bit more research there. And you may change that to a three. That's also, um, that indicates to an assumption that you've been holding. Um, and then those top challenges inform what you do next, which is the thing that you're most interested in. How do we progress forwards? So we use this innovation canvas as um, a guiding framework to, to have conversations with different innovators and it really helps guide the conversation particularly when there's so many facets and uh, elements to your project that you're working on. Um, there we go so at the end of this we kind of hope that you should be able to cross off everything if you are scoring five across everything then the question is why do you need help? Um, why have you not got funding already? Why are you not a commercial success? So um, if you are to use this, I would, I would challenge, you know, I would encourage you to challenge yourself and challenge your assumptions and try and be uh, honest with, with, with your scores. Um, so if somebody does score five across everything, if, if someone says I've got everything covered, you, uh, myself or um, an assessor of a funding competition or an investor or even a, a client would say, well, what's the catch then? If you've got it all covered, why do you need help? Uh, or why do you need funding? Or why hasn't someone done this before if it's so obvious and it's so easy? Um, or why haven't you uh, commercialized or sold your I I I idea yet? So um, this is um, a framework to try and help you be, be critical about yourself and the work that you've already undertaken in your project. Uh, so to summarize, the, um, there is no recipe for innovation. If there was, everyone would, would be doing it. What's more important is to be prepared for uncertainty and the unexpected. So, we've, so we use the innovation canvas to try and help people um, interrogate um, areas that they may have overlooked to challenge their uh, 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 assumptions, apologies, um, and to try and identify those top challenges to then um, really work out what their next important action points are. Uh, online version, I can share that link with you as well, so you can do it for yourselves. Um, and this is what it looks like here. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you can contact me at innovationcanvas.ktn/uk.org if you'd like to use this or know more about it. Brilliant. Thanks, Jake. That, that was excellent. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to crack straight on with uh, speaker number uh, three. So, Tim, if I can ask you to begin to get yourself set up. So, last speaker is Tim Borley. He's the Deputy Dean and Professor of Entrepreneurship at the University of Sheffield. So, Tim, straight on to you. Okay, yeah, great. Thanks very much. And, uh, and thanks for that, Jake. I think it kind of leads in uh, quite nicely to what I'm going to say as well. So um, just before I kind of kick in, what I'm going to say today is, is really kind of Jake talked about innovation um, 
problematizing what innovation is. I, I was looking back at some work that I did and I worked quite closely with Innovate UK and the KTN on a number of things. Um, and probably about four years ago now, one of the things that I was involved with was working um, with Innovate UK, thinking about um, that innovation is not just about technology, it's not just about widgets. So I'm gonna be talking today a bit more about kind of innovation, but thinking at the business model end. Um, far from being an ivory tower academic, I kind of work a lot with businesses, work a lot with policy makers around kind of innovation and enterprise policy. Um, and I'm particularly thinking at the moment a lot about the kind of impact of the crisis. So we're working a lot with businesses thinking about how we can help them best respond. Um, bit of a strange time for me as well. Um, I'm uh, jumping through my slides. Uh, I'm moving institutions uh, in the next couple of weeks. So one of the things that you can do is if you want to reach out to me, uh, you can find my details there and we'll share them at the end as well. So um, one of the things that businesses often talk about, not least when they're trying to access cash, is the business plan. So recently around COVID-19, we've seen lots of people thinking about trying to engage, looking at um, the nature of uh, disruption loans, the opportunity to access um, these kind of loans, but actually what becomes really important is not just the business plan, uh, is thinking about the business model. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today really builds on this side of things. And the business model defined there as what is important for the successful operation of the business. So how do we move away from planning to think much more about that business model? I apologise, my slides seem to be jumping through, but um, key to this and kind of picking up on what Mark said uh, and what Jake said as well, uh, is this idea of the innovation mindset. So rather than thinking about innovation from simply an inside out perspective taking what assets and resources that you have in the firm and um, try thinking about it from what we call an outside in perspective now jake kind of uh, had the killer statistic of thousands of hours of great minds at ktn contributing into what the canvas does from their end the work that we've done trying to build up on this by lots and lots of in-depth research undertaken with a variety of firms across the piece so really trying to think about the differences in these approaches and how that can be exploited. And I bring that back to what I was saying about Innovate UK, do lots of excellent programs funding the development of innovation, much of it technologically driven. But one of the big challenges is how do we then integrate that effectively into the business model? How do we think about realizing the value of that sustainably over the longer term? So yes, we need to think about projects, we need to think about the capabilities we have as a firm, but how can we switch this? What are the opportunities to think about the different components of the value model and trying to create value for your customers and your clients by taking that outside in perspective, looking at the external world and trying to flip that round. So um, it kind of brings me on to really the crux of what I wanted to talk about. And this is the notion of business model innovation. So one of the key things in a lot of research done on this through the Harvard Business Review and the likes talks about how the key to succeeding here and being a business is the flexible flexibility and the opportunity to response responsively act in relation to what's going on in the market now obviously a kind of a real critical time and challenge at the moment regarding the kind of covid crisis but what we're seeing is lots of businesses thinking about how they can react in order to first of all survive but also to build that resilience and that capacity moving forward so when i talk about business model innovation it's kind of from my perspective thinking about these non-obvious but kind of key customer centric kind of values how can we think about the resources the assets the processes that the business uses and how can we more effectively realign them around the revenue model and thinking about new value propositions and for many businesses this is kind of taking them really outside of their comfort zone um, the business plan, whether it's on a fag packet or it's a formally kind of developed document, often sits in a drawer. Uh, but the business model in developing it is how things are operationalized. How can we actually put this into practice, do it differently and try and create more value for the client? And I saw one of the questions earlier coming up about it's not always focused around the problem. And I think that that's quite right. The problem, and I, I agree with the kind of the point acronym that there's some real value of thinking about that pain but it's also about the opportunity and innovation around the business model can address both of these. And sometimes it's not about just developing something new. It's about thinking about the processes and the way in which the business works internally and also the customer, the client being focused on them, recognizing that that is where and how value is created. 
So the work that we've done, we've kind of taken this research, looking at manufacturers, looking at creative industries, looking across the piece to try and better understand um, how we can help businesses think through this process. Uh, and this is what we came up with. I mean, we're all about tools today, sharing ideas. Uh, this isn't an answer. I'm not here as a business advisor, but what I wanna try and do is to bring a bit of perspective that can help some of the participants on this webinar think about what they might be able to do and especially at this point in time. So thinking about what you might be able to do around delivering your existing products, using existing technologies to existing markets, but creating value around what might otherwise be rather invisible opportunities. And it's often these invisible opportunities that kind of are internal to the business that help businesses create something that isn't easily replicable by others. So, when we talk about kind of innovation, and again, I kind of said this blog that I've done previously, working with colleagues at Innovate, very much thinking about innovation here uh, is thinking about the offering. So we talk a lot about the product performance. How can we change that? Um, how can we develop the nature of the product? So um, whole point of business model innovation, though, very much trying to say, well, there's a lot more to go at. We can really kind of pick up on this opportunity in different ways. So where can we innovate the configuration of the business or the experience that customers take away from the business so um, lots of the things that i've been talking to businesses about recently are focused on uh, interaction so the experience of the customer with the business uh, massive challenge at the moment social distancing we need to think about the blend of physical and digital interaction slightly differently we need to think about not only how we sell to customers and clients but how we interact with them how do we maintain that engagement Conversely, if we flip to the other side, the kind of configuration space, um, what does the nature of the crisis now mean for the revenue model? How have we got to change it? Are there things that we can do differently? How can we exploit and pick up on the network, which our businesses and owner managers, individuals are part of to try and realize new opportunities? So I couch this in terms of the crisis at the moment, but I think it for me is something that's much more broad. We were certainly using and talking with businesses about this prior to the crisis, some of these areas have become particularly important at the moment certainly we're seeing some products change but the key message and the key takeaway for me is that it's not just about the product it's not just about the offering as the blog says uh, it's not just about the widget we don't necessarily need to go from version to 1.1 to 1.2 and see that as innovation innovation can be in all of these dimensions the way that the uh, the kind of circles constructed there you can see the core darker colors now that for me is the business model. It's very hard to play in this space if we don't understand our own business model. And then what we can do is we can innovate in particular segments. We don't need to do it all at once and we can think in different ways and think creatively about this. So um, in terms of kind of breaking this down a little bit further, um, what you can see there, we've tried to keep this simple. I think when you look at some of the canvases and there's a lot out there and Jake's kind of highlighted one, people will probably be familiar with the business model canvas. Um, it's about trying to kind of think about what a good outcome is like. So I really like when Mark was talking about the world that hasn't yet been created. When we're talking about innovation in the business model for me, it's thinking about what we can do differently, what we can take in different directions. Um, I'm a big advocate of thinking about this in the way of how you create value for your clients. So this isn't about trying to make more money. It's not kind of focused on that initially. That's the end. Yes, desirable for every business. But if you add value to your clients, the logic is that that will follow. So thinking about the offering, we can look at developing new products, processes and services. We're seeing some of that at the moment. During the crisis, and I think beyond the crisis, how do we innovate the customer experience? The way in which you engage with your customer or your end user, recognizing that they might be different. And how do they engage with you, recognizing that that process with customer and client is two way? We, we don't just engage with them, we want them to engage with us. And again, the example of Painter that Mark talked about, a good example of that. And in terms of the configuration, the way that the business is organized, the way that it's works and structured to create value. So we kind of break this down using the tool that we've created uh, in a slightly different way to the way the innovation canvas works. Um, we try to kind of actually not overly focus on the offering. We recognize that when it comes to the nature of the business, businesses are constantly trying to innovate and increase the value and performance of their offer. But what about these other dimensions? What about how we blend physical and digital interaction? What about the way in which we have different channels to engage and communicate with customers and clients and users? 
and the way that we work internally. How do we kind of maximize? How do we bring transactions that are not just payment at a particular point of time in a particular type of kind of online or physical environment, kind of the, the difference between bricks and clicks? How can we blend them? Can we sell our product and service at different points? Can we modularize? Can we look at opportunities to kind of engage with networks to maximize the way in which we are engaging with different client bases and different customers? So um, in order to do this, what we've come up with, and again, I'm kind of really happy to share, you'll have seen the uh, email address on the first slide, but also at the bottom of some of these slides, um, is this deck of cards. So we very much have something that's a physical product. We tend to kind of work with businesses, go out to businesses and do these. Uh, We've been offering online sessions uh, through the University of Sheffield and will through uh, Cranfield again when I move, uh, but trying to kind of explore some of these issues. And uh, I don't know if my picture is still visible, but um, we've got these as kind of boxed physical versions, which you can play with and you can take away. Uh, and if you want to reach out to me after this, then quite happy to send some of these out when uh, I can get back into the office and physically get my hands on them. But it's trying to think through about how you make these work for you. Not all of the cards are going to be relevant to every business, but there's lots of prompts there. And I think one of the key challenges that when engaging with businesses, we can get them over that first hurdle to think about what their business model is. But the next piece is then what are the questions that we want to stimulate to get them to innovate and not just innovate around the technology or the offering? How do we get them to innovate about the integration and the incorporation of some of these technologies into the business to realize value? So uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell for me. Like I say, I'm not a business advisor. I'm not a sit in the office academic. We've trialed, we've tested, we've developed this based on research insight, uh, but very much something that I hope will be of interest to people uh, on the call today. So if you want to contact me or you want to follow up, you want to find out more about the research, then please get in touch. Uh, and if you're interested in trying to either get a digital version or a physical version of the tool, then please do reach out. Um, We've used it in a multitude of different ways, working with kind of small and medium businesses where we've tried to do it with their exec team um, or the owner manager group. Uh, we've done it with larger businesses where we've taken a segment of people from the kind of um, floor and the operational level right the way through to the CEO. Uh, and you get lots of different perspectives. So really keen to kind of uh, share what we've done. Hope that it adds some value back to you guys. Brilliant. Thanks, Tim. And thanks to all of our uh, speakers on that session. We now move on to the panel, the sort of Q&A part of, of today. Now, it's going to be relatively short, I have to say. Um, and we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, with that in mind, um, what I would suggest is that um, we're not going to get through all the questions, but if you get your question typed and written in at some point before the webinar clocks off, then we'll make sure to get an answer and a response to you. We'll share it with our panellists. Um, etc. We have had uh, a few people asking through the Q&A in the chat about access to the Innovation Campus, uh, Canvas story that, that Jake uh, presented. We'll make sure again to send out the details of how you can do that um, to participants, but please do now start submitting your questions through the Q&A. Jake, there was one question that came to you. I noticed you've answered it via the Q&A, but just for the, the benefit of others on the call, um, the question was, um, if you were running a design thinking workshop, at what stage would you recommend using the Innovation Campus? Canvas, sorry. Uh, very good question. Uh, I would say that um, I, I also, you know, I want to re reinforce the idea that the existence of the Innovation Canvas is just a, a hack uh, to get us thinking the right way because we're just monkeys in shoes, really. Um, and the existence of all these tools and books and how-to guides and whatever else are just hacks. So it is not the um, it is not the be-all and end-all. It is um, just a way to help you. So um, we find that it's most beneficial for uh, early stage innovators, both entrepreneurs like one one-man bands, but also large corporates too, um, and the super users that I've said in this answer will use it throughout the life of an R&D project from con um, conception all the way through to realization. So I've shared a link to a case study about Playdale who use it as their, um, as a, a bit of a metric or um, a bit of an ass assessor of, of ideas. And every month they will review 
the progress of that idea all the way through to com completion. And that's an excellent use of the innovation canvas. Um, but just like design thinking, it, it, it is a way to, to help you think about your project and can be used at uh, any stage across many different in, in, in industries. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Jake. Um, we have a, a kind of broader question. How, how do I engage with innovation support available from the KTN and Product Design Scotland? If I could direct you towards, I guess, in the first instance, both myself and Abby. Again, we'll share contact details with that and we'll make sure that you have access to the support available and indeed the other members of those networks where that is um, uh, relevant. Um, I'm very conscious of time. I think we've got time just for one quick final question before we, we move on. Um, there is a question around IP. Now, Tim, Jake, Mark, anybody wants to put a hand up that could so, answer a question? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say a couple of words about IP, which is like, you really need to think about why you're um, pursuing IP in the first place. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, and what is the value that you will get from protecting your intellectual property? Uh, for a lot of investors, it, 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 IP is used as confidence to say no one else is going to swoop in here and, and take and like claim claim this space. For a lot of uh, innovators, when you've obtained that IP, you spend your whole life then trying to uh, stop competitors doing doing um, or in, 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 in infringing on it. So you really need to ask yourself, what value am I getting from this IP? If it's if it's to provide confidence that you've really got a true innovation, how else can you provide that, that like confidence? Could you do that through user testing? Could you do that through uh, uh, iterative prototyping, for instance? Um, you should really only be getting IP when, you've, when you are fully certain that you've covered the technical aspects and you've validated the, uh, the innovation on your intended market. And Mark, one final question to you before before we wrap up. Um, do insights fall out of user needs program, or do these two processes um, um, are they are they parallel activities? Mark, there. That helps, doesn't it? There's a user needs problem. Um, Yes, insights can fall out of using these programs. I'm, I'm a massive, massive fan of talking to users, following users, following them when they're not looking as well, when they're not expecting to be watched. And you do see insights there for, for certain. Um, I had a classic one working with a, a, a drinks manufacturer looking at less sweet drinks and the user insight was consumers preferred less sweet drinks. So we recruited um, 50 consumers who preferred less sweet drinks one of which had lost his legs due to diabetes and couldn't get to the venue that we'd hired in the States. So we took him for a coffee to his place of choice, which was McDonald's. And when I went to get his coffee, he had um, a coffee with nine creamers, N nine creamers. Creamers in America are sweetened. So we had equivalent of nine teaspoons of sugar in his coffee. And he'd expressed a preference for less sweet. So, so, so his, his desire, his demand, was he wanted to be healthier. The, in reality, the insight was he, he favoured fla favored taste over health every single time. And we'd never have known that if we'd just listened to his form, if we just read his form. So absolutely, dig deep into consumers, but at the same time, go and watch. Go, go and stand in supermarket aisles. Go and stand in, in your set to go and talk to people if you're a dentist. Go and talk to people who, who sit in waiting rooms. What is the problem with going to the dentist? find out, talk to them in, in depth. Insights come from, in reality, they come from everywhere. There was another question on there as well about radio, which I've, I've answered um, Alistair um, with, by typing, the magic, magic typing. That's great, thanks for that, Mark. Right, okay, I'm gonna to bring to an end the, the formal part of the Q&A. You probably still have about two or three minutes to jot your questions down before we close the webinar, if, if, if you wish uh, to do that. Many thanks again to all of our excellent speakers today and to you guys sitting at home or, or wherever you are for your questions and comments so far. I hope you found it informative and, and entertaining as well in equal measure. Uh, and I'm just going to pass you back now to Abby uh, to, to close off today's session. Yeah, thanks for that, Ali. Thanks to all the speakers. That was yeah, really, really uh, 
brilliant uh, insights that you've provided there. Just to mention the next session running next week, another three great speakers lined up is going to be on scale and manufacturing. And the final one in this block of four is in the design processes and principles, but longer term, we've got 12 in the series that we're planning so far. And I've noticed today there's been lots of questions on IP. So yeah, we've got us we've got a session on IP planned. I think that's week nine. But ne next week we'll be starting to promote the other um, lunchtime sessions that are in the series. So thank you everybody very much for joining today, and thank you again to to the speakers.